Well, um, it is good morning uh, as I record this, but the sessions are had, held in the afternoons on Wednesdays. So this is the first in a six hour uh, uh, series on the brain. Um, it's been quite a challenge putting this together. Uh, you might think not because I've had over 40 years in neuroscience and uh, clinical neurology, but in fact, it really was a challenge, perhaps more of a challenge than any other series I've done, if only because of trying to be selective about the material and what might interest you the most. Um, it, it, I want to add a, a note about perspective here because um, this series and the two before it, the Nobel series, which uh, last fall was the third in that series, um, that's, and, and the physics series, they're all linked uh, because in the, in, the, in the physics series and the Nobel series, at least for the talks that I gave, there were usually some introductory slides that, that um, uh, had something about the human journey from our beginnings as a common ancestor in Africa six or eight million years ago uh, to the present. And I'm really very interested in, uh, in this transition. Um, and, and the transition is really, you know, for, for most of that time, for all but say the last 200 to 300,000 years of our becoming fully human, there wasn't much to distinguish from us from other animals. Uh, uh, whether they were four-footed or two-footed. But things changed sometime around perhaps a, a half a million years ago, maybe, maybe more recently, we don't really know. Um, but, but and, and that change was a change in the brain and the brain's capacity to imagine and to create and to eventually uh, develop symbolic uh, thought and language, and, and our species has become very much a, a storytelling species with a sense of the past and the future. And for the first time, as Robin Dunbar and others have co commented on, um, uh, we, unlike any other species, can live in a virtual world, an alternate reality, inhabited by virtual creatures. And all of the makings of art and novels, theater and poetry and physics and chemistry, all of those are products of our human brain and much more. So it's really to explore, uh, although today um, we'll look at our kind of fossil past or historical past over the last several million years and how our brain got from there to here, but, but remember and keep in your mind that, that it's really about that latter period, that transformational time in the evolution of our brain, and that will probably continue on in the future. So, um, let's get a little perspective here. Um, um, I always like to do this at, at the start of these, just to set the stage. Um, the mammalian nervous systems consist of nerve cells, and, and uh, the main signal from of those nerve cells are action potentials. We'll talk more about that later, but these spikes, well, they only last about a thousandth of a second. Um, and, um, and you can see the perspective of the day and the maturation of the human brain isn't over really from the time of conception up to say 25 years, maybe longer in males. And then one favorite of mine is, is this wonderful piece uh, by Michael Shermer, um, who looking out in the night sky at Andromeda, now that's our nearest galaxy, um, realized that the light falling on his retinas originated in Andromeda 
about 3.2 million years ago, which would be about the time, roughly, that the famous Lucy was walking the earth. That, that's an extraordinary, that's an extraordinary um, perspective in time. And to realize that the first galaxies uh, began to appear 13.5 billion years ago. And of course, the Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago. So, um, so our time on, st on the stage, if you like, uh, is a very, very thin slice of that whole time. Now, here's uh, a way of thinking about the brain. It's, uh, it's my way of thinking about it, but um, so I'll just read this. That gelatinous mass inside our skull, our brain, is what's special. The rest of our body is simply the supporting cast, tasked with getting us around, implementing our intentions and impulses, keeping us in touch with the world through our senses, providing fuel to keep the brain going and taking out the garbage. But it is the brain that does all the really interesting and important stuff, like planning, solving problems, writing, creating music or other art forms, orchestrating complex, highly coordinated body movements, talking and playing games, loving, and perhaps, as some mystics might suggest, possessing a soul. And I'm going to turn to the, la to the last issue in the, in the sixth session. So how did such a marvelous machine evolve? Well, um, I've taken the evolutionary perspective in this first session to the brain because, because brains are on a continuum. And no less than uh, Darwin and a student of his, Romanes, um, thought in the, in the latter half of the 1800s that, that even the simplest of creatures, an earthworm, a jellyfish had some intelligence, some mental process, some awareness. In fact, Romanes actually wrote a book on the mental lives of animals, but the emphasis was on very primitive animals. Um, and you can see that that bottom reference of jellyfish, starfish, and sea urchins, research on the primitive nervous system. So. Um, it wasn't an, an odd thing for them to think about intelligence in, in uh, what we would call primitive uh, uh, organisms. And indeed, returning to Charles Darwin, just as that quote at the bottom. Um, and by the way, the last book he wrote was on what uh, was on the earthworm. What millions and millions of earthworms could actually do in changing the soil and the land, given enough time. Anyway, uh, that last quote, worms deserve to be called intelligent, for they act in nearly the same manner as man under similar conditions. I think he was referring to, to danger. Now, let's. here's another perspective here, the number of nerve cells. Well, uh, some people, have argued that single cells with no nerve cells in them exhibit some form of intelligence. And what do they mean by that? Um, well, they learn and they remember what they learn and their behavior is adaptive. So in some, at some level, um, that's a form of intelligence. The roundworm, C. elegans, uh, what, was very, is a very simple um, worm. It has precisely 302 nerve cells, uh, all of whose connections are known in detail, as well as the specific genes that direct them. Um, the jellyfish has a thousand, around a thousand nerve cells and relatively complex uh, behaviors. Again, learning, adapting and remembering. Some species of wasps with uh, say thousands of nerve cells, not, not millions, but thousands of nerve cells are quite capable of recognizing differences in the faces of different 
wasps within the colony. So facial recognition among wasps. House flies are there now, we're getting up into the hundreds of thousands, so 350,000. Um, so the common mouse, uh, skipping down 14, uh, 14 million, the house cat, uh, 60 million, and the human somewhere around 80 to 100 uh, billion nerve cells. Now I can, I can assure you that no one has counted uh, cell by cell the number. What they've done is they've sampled the brain in different areas and extrapolated from those counts. But anyway, uh, it's roughly somewhere between 70 to 100, maybe 110 billion nerve cells. And, and many of those nerve cells, individual nerve cells are connected with as many as five to 30,000 other nerve cells. So it's really in the power of the networking that brains achieve uh, what they've achieved, especially in, in highly complex evolved species such as ours. And I would include Neanderthals in that, or at least any late developed uh, 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 human in uh, the course of evolution in the last, say, uh, half million years. Elephants uh, have twice as many nerve cells as we do, and whales, uh, uh, similar. They're, the number of nerve cells seems to be related in some way to the size of the body, but, uh, but elephants and whales have very complex social lives, and they do communicate with one another, and they have very good memories, and they do anticipate things. So, um, so they may not be writing uh, theses on, um, on relativity, but they're very clever, uh, intelligent animals, both of them. Now, um, it was uh, news to me to find out that Sigmund Freud actually had a background in, in basic science. He worked with uh, Ramonica Hall, who got the Nobel Prize uh, for his work on, on um, uh, the nature uh, of nerve cells and how they connected with other nerve cells. But he, but Freud makes this interesting observation. Now, this is before he became a clinical psychiatrist. And he said, All, although neurons may differ in shape and size, they're they, they, they are essentially the same cut from the same primitive animal life to the most advanced, meaning their nervous systems, however primitive, are based on, on the unit here, our nerve cells. And whether it's a jellyfish with a thousand or a human being with a hundred billion, uh, the, the unit of the nervous systems is the same. And uh, Romani has made the same comment, a uh, wonderful book on um, 1884, I've read parts of it online, the mental evolution, the mental evolution in animals. I mean, we just don't think that way these days. I don't know why we do that, but anyway, we don't. Um, so moving along, now here's a slide that, that, that just shows what's happened to brain size over time in the human journey from our, the last common ancestor to us and, and, and the present. And on the left side, basically the whole left side there, we're talking about small brain bipedal apes, the Australopithes, most of them. Now, there, there were other species as well. And, and they had chimpanzee sized brains, something between 300 and 500 cc's. And then somewhere around uh, 2 million years ago, maybe a little bit later, um, uh, evolution, uh, products of the, the product of evolution, or at least the movement, was toward uh, taller, larger um, uh, people who were upright all of the time, bipedal, fully bipedal, and fluid at it. Um, and, and with increasingly larger brains. And I suppose the poster child for this whole period, at least for a million and a half years of it, is Homo erectus. We'll talk a little bit more about erectus later. But anyway, in 
Erectus is tenure on, on Earth, uh, from Africa to Southeast Asia, the brain increase uh, by at least twofold, maybe more. And then we reach the Neanderthals and humans, and maybe the Denosphans. We don't have any skulls for the Denosphans, but they're close cousins to us, just as the Neanderthals are. And, and um, actually, the Neanderthals have brains that are maybe 100, 200 cc's larger than ours. But the shape of the skull, and therefore the shape of the underlying brain, uh, is somewhat different. Uh, they have larger orbits, larger retinas, larger visual systems, larger occipital visual cortex at the back of the brain. But if anything, on a proportional basis, the frontal lobes and the temporal lobes are perhaps a little smaller. I don't want to make too much of that, uh, but um, because it, 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 we simply don't have a, enough information about that. Uh, Let's face it, uh, the, the brain, when people are buried, the brain doesn't last long. And so for all of these species that we're talking about, we don't actually have any chunks of brain around. We might have DNA to tap. What we have is the skull that contained that brain. And so what's been created uh, have been endocasts of, of that space and the impression those brains left on the, on the inner side of the skull as they develop. Uh, well, that's like phrenology. The, the phrenology, the study of the shape of the skull and therefore the inferred shape of the brain underneath was a very popular thing in Conan Doyle's time, the, the, Sherlock, the fictional Sherlock Holmes, uh, Morarity, um, his rival. Um, uh, Anyway, I, I, it's a bit of silliness to, to focus all of our attention on brain size and, and even on the shape of the brain. But the, this on the, on the left, they're shown at the top left of the chimpanzee and a couple of the australopists, uh, one of them gracile and robust. What, what do we actually mean about that? Well, some, some the australopists were very uh, successful um, a genus uh, in our ancestors that lasted almost three million, three and a half million years, appeared about four and a half million years ago, and the last of them may be gone, say 1.3, 1.4 million years ago. So a long tenure. And there were a lot of variant themes uh, among the Australopiths, but they were all followed a central theme, meaning they were small brain, chimpanzee-sized brain, uh, bipedal apes with behavior to match. There may have been some tool making, but not much. And, um, uh, but it's fair to point out that chimpanzees uh, make, uh, make and use tools, uh, as do COVID birds uh, and some other species. So we shouldn't fuss too much about tool making. And then, um, uh, at the top, uh, 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 or at least at the bottom, Homo, Homo sapiens and Homo erectus at the top. So, um, so let's just move along. Now, there are several issues I want to deal with here because um, because uh, they've created some misunderstanding about how to approach the, the evolution of our species and any other species. In Darwin's um, book, The Origin of Species, the one that totally transformed how uh, we've looked at, at the, the evolution of, of species ever since, has one figure in that book, it's often been repeated, and it shows a, a branch, I'm just holding up my hand here, but it, it's like a, a common root. And then, and then at some point in time, uh, these, that common root becomes branches or, or like a tree, tree uh, has branches above ground and also below in the roots. 
um, which don't uh, kind of turn back on one another. And, and the assumption is that once they split, they, they split. Well, that isn't actually what's happened from an evolutionary point of view. When, when species split, they didn't, uh, it wasn't an overnight affair. Uh, they, they probably split or diverged, might be another way of putting it, over periods of hundreds of, uh, if not thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of years, in which period they may have continued to exchange genes, um, had sex with one another, so mixing their genes, and only fully di 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 diverging uh, when they found kind of separate niches. So that's, that's one important point. Um, the other thing is about uh, just moving down that list, ghost species. One of the real evolution, one of the extraordinary and revolutionary things uh, in the study of evolution has been the recognition that there are some species that are whose presence is recognizable in the genomes of surviving of, of us in these days and some ancient genomes uh, dating back uh, you know, 50,000, 100,000, maybe 200,000 years or more. And in looking at those genomes, uh, there's uh, more than a strong hint that there must have been other species variants for which we have no fossils. Now that makes a lot of sense to me. It suggests that, that evolution has, has been far more complex uh, than we've imagined so far or the fossil record uh, would, would suggest. So um, how, uh, what about tracking human origins? Well, uh, genetics, really came of age in its contribution to the evolution of all species in, in the late 1900s, uh, 1970s, 1980s. Um, uh, you may remember mitochondrial Eve using uh, the DNA from uh, mitochondria. I think there are 37 genes, so it's not very complex. But by looking at, at, uh, at modern day humans, and with a calculation about the rate at which mutations occur and counting the number of mutations in, in living humans, um, uh, figuring out, well, when, when was the stem parent around, in this case, the mother. Now that wouldn't have been one female, it was more likely several hundred, perhaps uh, over a thousand. And, but anyway, those studies suggested that, that mito mitochondrial Eve or a group of of, uh, of females, um, uh, the mothers of our modern humans, existed sometime between, uh, say, 100,000 uh, to 200,000 years ago, and in Africa. Now, along uh, along the way, uh, especially at the Max Planck Institute in Germany, they developed a whole technology for for um, finding and mapping the genomes of uh, our deep ancestors dating back to thousands of years, even hundreds of thousands of years. I think the oldest, not for us, but at least uh, I think uh, one mammal went back say uh, a million years, that's a long time. And DNA is very fragile and finding it in the first place and not contaminating it, it in the second place and then trying to, and it's often kind of chewed up into bits and pieces and stringing those bits and pieces together is, uh, is, is, is a very, um, it, it's, it's an extraordinary puzzle. But nonetheless, it's been mastered. Uh, first of all, at the Max Planck Institute, as I mentioned, but, but later um, in, at, at Harvard. And uh, so those are the two main institutions. There are other tools for tracking ancestry. That includes myoglobin and hemoglobin. Uh, many of the genes that we have, say 10% or 10 or 15% of our genes are protein encoding genes. Proteins are made up of chains of amino acids and uh, myoglobin and hemoglobin might contain, uh, or collagen might contain thousands of amino acids strung out in a row. 
and and along the way in an evolutionary path, maybe one or two amino acids might change. Doesn't change the function of the molecule much, if, if at all, but it, it it changes its molecular identity. So it provides a way of uh, of identifying uh, relatedness between species. For example, I think. Um, uh, Chimpanzee myoglobin and human myoglobin differ. That's a muscle protein, by the way. Uh, differ by, I think, differs by one amino acid, could be two, but anyway, uh, another tool. So, moving along, here's our history, um, at least for, well, put simplistically. And there's that, that kind of branching tree. Now, um, the last common ancestor for the branch that eventually led to modern humans and the branch that led to chimpanzees and their closely related cousins, bonobos, existed somewhere between five and six million years ago in Africa. Gorillas branched off earlier, as you can see, I think it's probably around uh, eight or nine million years ago and orangutans more than 10 million years ago. But the common ancestor to all of these might go back say 11 or 12 million years, maybe, maybe longer to some ancestral ape that was partially bipedal at some time, um, but with a brain perhaps the size of or smaller than chimpanzees. Now, just ignore the, the top part there, go down to the bottom third, but four to five, I mentioned these uh, Australopiths, um, they're probably ancestral to modern humans. Uh, there are many more examples than the four that I have here, but I just highlight the ones that you might know about, and especially one that you might know about, Aparensis, uh, uh, the famous Lucy, named by Johansson and uh, an American Johansson. And um, after the Beatles song, uh, Lucy and the Sky. So, um, so with a brain size of uh, what is it? Uh, 374 to 417 CC. So small brain, but, but, but bipedal eight. And, and this is what one of them looks like. This is uh, Anamensis, uh, 3.8 million years ago. Um, just a word about, about, about the appearance. If the, if the animals, if these species lived in an area where it was difficult to find uh, easily chewable food, and they had to dig it up on tough leg, legumes, for, for example, um, they would develop uh, uh, the muscles of the jaw would, would, would develop more larger jaws, larger teeth, and, um, and a, a very prominent lower, lower, lower jaw and face. So that's the robustness form. The gracile or finer uh, types were, were probably species that uh, had more ready access to easily chewable, uh, fruit and vegetables, and didn't need large teeth and large jaw muscles and a large mandible, and so less well developed or less uh, less formidable, if you like, looking lower lower jaw and and face. So that's the difference between the gracile and and robustus forms. So moving along, here's an, an interesting piece. I, I I really like this one because. That's, um, that's Aparensis, that's uh, the species that Lucy came from. And, and um, uh, but in the middle, in Tanzania, uh, they found multiple tracks. Uh, uh, and these are tracks left by Aparensis. And, and this one is a particularly moving one because this would be 3.4, Million years ago, something like that, and um, and you'll see that that there are large footprints and smaller ones. So 
it's easy to imagine. And by the way, they're walking along at a leisurely place. They're not in any rush. And, and they have a, a, a fairly modern uh, walk, uh, first touching with their heel, uh, and then rolling forward to the to the um, to the big toe and the four and the forefoot, and and they have arches. They, the arches are now well developed, and the toe is far less opposable and and separate from the other toes. So so not not fully bipedal yet, but has come a long way. But isn't it touching to see that that youngster? walking along beside, uh, I imagine a parent, perhaps a mother, uh, we don't know. Um, these footprints are often quite, uh, quite riveting. And that's the area of Tanzania where, where, uh, where so many of these tracks have been found. And by the way, these prints were, one that I showed you, um, were, were left in ash. And, um, and I guess it rained and the combination of that particular kind of ash and, and rain uh, almost made a concrete uh, and uh, form for forever uh, left these footprints for us to, to discover. So now we, we switch uh, or kind of move along there's a kind of a transitional period of maybe several hundred thousand years uh, between the Australopiths that although there was a great deal of variation among them, depending on where they actually lived um, and the adaptations that they, that they made for light in that, in that area. Um, and and su successful as they were, Perhaps one or more of them um, uh, transitioned or morphed uh, into a slightly larger brain, um, uh, but 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 still bipedal ape. Um, and then the the, the appearance around 1.7, 1 1.8 uh, million years ago uh, with erectus, Homo erectus. Now, Homo erectus, I'll just say a little about Homo erectus. Homo erectus, this kind of named uh, species, was around for a long time. I mean, uh, the, the, the last versions of erectus may have been around, say, 100, 200, uh, 100 or 100,000 years ago in, in, in the Far East. In fact, the Chinese. Uh, suggest and with reasonable evidence that that modern humans may have um, evolved separately in China um, uh, and did and may not have originated say from Africa. Well, be that as it may, but um, but anyway, uh, so in in Erectus's long tenure, 1.5, 1.8. Uh, million years, the brain size doubled and, um, and probably later versions of erectus, the size of the brain approached the lower limit for modern humans. And almost seamlessly, say uh, uh, 800, 700, 800,000 years ago, uh, either late erectus or something that late erectus morphed into, um, began to make finer tools um, and maybe some of the earliest art uh, in the form of etchings or scratches on, on, on bone that looked intentional. Um, and, um, and then that, that proto late version of erectus uh, may have given um, Origins to two main branches, or three three branches, one of which led eventually to modern humans, another of which uh, led to, uh, say, around four hundred thousand years ago, to kind of diverged. One became Neanderthals in 
from uh, Europe right through to Asia. The other became um, the Denosophans, kind of a mystery species we'll talk about a little bit later, but anyway, closely related, had sex with one another and also modern humans in later times. So all closely related. Um, and then one arm of that common root, late erectus perhaps, um, uh, may have evolved into some of these ghost species for which or for whom we have no fossils. Um, and then so, and then these archaic humans have already referred to as Neanderthals, uh, Denosophans, but, uh, but they're also in, in the record um, skulls and in, in, uh, in fossil skulls in, in, in Morocco that um, are somewhere between modern human and, and Neanderthal. I happen to think they look more Neanderthal than modern human, but anyway, and they date to just over 300,000 years ago. But anyway, the, the genetic and the fossil evidence suggests that anatomically modern, meaning skull shapes, uh, the shape of the skull and the face and the teeth and the jaws were like us. We don't know when anatomically modern humans transition to behaviorally modern humans. That's a whole other thing to bring up later. Now, there's a lot of variation. I mean, if you walk around Niagara and the Lake St. Catharines or Toronto, if you're aware that uh, people are taller and medium uh, height and, and, and uh, shorter, and some are, uh, uh, some are kind of, uh, I'm not speaking about those who work out, but differences in build and, um, and, uh, and facial features. So there's a lot of variation among humans um, uh, around the world in, uh, in their appearance. And, um, and that was true early on. And, and it, it was a, uh, I think there were five skulls that were found in this Georgian site dating back uh, one point, almost 1.8 million years. And, 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 and quite a difference in the size of, of, of the skulls. Um, now, there is an issue. In the, in the small-brained apes, um, there was quite a difference between the female and male size. And maybe that accounts for some of these differences in sizes in the skulls in Georgia. I don't know. But anyway, uh, here's, what that, here's what that, remember I talked about the skulls in, in, uh, in Georgia? Well, here's a side view of what uh, one would look like. But, um, but the human skull, at least most humans, is globular in shape, more rounded. This is flatter, more longitudinal. It, it has that kind of bony development about the eyes. And although the face has certainly become a lot flatter, it still isn't quite modern human. So I would think there was a lot of, um, uh, I think this, this, this particular skull that we're looking at was somewhere in between, has still some Neanderthal features. And maybe some of those features uh, originated much earlier or were passed along from late versions of Erectus. So um, anyway, here's a, a reconstructed picture of what at least one uh, skull might have looked like uh, with a flesh put on it. Uh, created by John Gurchy, who, who does this kind of very creative work for the Smithsonian Institute. Um, it uh, looks very, um, very, very much alive, doesn't it? Especially with the eyes. Now, I, I'm showing you this just to show or to illustrate another principle. Here we have from, from the left to, to the right, an early Neanderthal and the earliest Neanderthals that we have, that at least um, the people are willing to identify as Neanderthals, were found in a, in a, um, in a pit in Spain and date back over 400,000 years. And then just to the right of that is a late Neanderthal 
an example of that, 60 to 70,000 years ago. Now, and I, I think that was from um, uh, Western, Western Europe uh, as well. And, um, and, and around the time when um, some artwork, or at least on cave walls and, and jewelry, had been created by um, but one of the points I want to make about the, these differences between those two groups of Neanderthals is that um, we speak of species, but what, what, what we mean by that is a certain constellation of anatomical features, usually of the skull, the volume of the shape of the skull, the flatness of the face or, or, the, or uh, largeness and how much it protrudes at the side. Jaw, the teeth, uh, and various joints in the her kind of skeletal features. But, um, but the point is that those features weren't all acquired at the same time. So uh, these main species, the Neanderthal, um, they acquired those, those, that full set of features. It took time for them to acquire all those all of those full features that, that we would associate with Neanderthals and certainly with the Australopithecus before that. So, so all of these species are, are really moving targets um, as far as their skeletal traits, their traits go. And, and, and for some of them, uh, at least a few of them, they must have transitioned, although it's hard, hard to find that the transitional forms in, in between, transition to more modern and slowly or more gradually. So all of all these species, all these main species are really transitional forms. That's a better way to think about it, I think. Now, then we have the Moroccan skull, uh, second from the right and, uh, and a modern human um, on, on the right. So just moving along here. Um, well, I really just wanted to show you that that modern humans left Africa relatively early, based on the evidence. Um, they apparently reached uh, Greece and maybe further north uh, as early as 200,000 years ago, or, or maybe even further back than that. And um, and certainly in the Arabian Peninsula and. Um, and the Middle East uh, around 100,000 years ago. Um, but it didn't take long uh, for, for some of them to reach China, 80, say around 100,000 years ago, uh, Sumatra, 70, Australia, 65,000 years ago. So um, modern humans, when they appeared on the evolutionary stage, from an early time, some of them were dispersing into, uh, into, into what is now uh, uh, Saudi Arabia and the Middle East. And, and over probably hundreds of thousands of years, uh, reaching uh, uh, the Far East. And so that, that was one way or a series of ways, probably a series of ways. Um, but, um, but this, I, I've really put this slide up because um, if you look at the, the reference below, one of the key figures is Chris Stringer. And Chris is at the Natural History Museum in London, England. And he's uh, one of the go-to people for the New York Times and the prestigious journal Nature if anything comes up about the human origin story, and for good reason, he's, he's quite an expert. But, uh, but it's interesting to look at the other groups that participated in this uh, genomic study and, uh, or this comparative genomics and fossil study. So here was Max Planck Institute, Jena in Germany, Cologne, Germany, um, University of Malta in Malta. 
and um, and Francis Crick. It was a group of ancient an ancient genomics lab in the UK. So so it it these are international efforts and uh, trying to figure out what happened uh, because uh, Homo erectus certainly was a traveler, but so were archaic humans and and uh, uh, later archaic humans or versions of Homo erectus and 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 Neanderthals. After all, Neanderthals kind of covered the, the map from Western Europe all the way to to Asia, and uh, so that these people got around, um, and modern humans did. And at, at, in various at various times. Um, so, uh, but there's it, it's a bit of a conundrum here because the fossil record that I'm referring to that same paper and that came out in February this year. The fossil record suggests that modern humans expanded out of Africa as early as 200,000 years ago, probably earlier. But the genetic records suggest that all present day out of Africa humans derive most of their ancestry from a worldwide expansion that occurred not 100,000 years ago, not 200,000 years ago, but from an expansion that occurred um, uh, only 50 to 60,000 years ago. Well, if both are true, the implication is that the early expansions seem to make little contribution to the to the genomes of present day humans. So what happened to those earlier expansions? Did they all kind of fizzle out and go extinct um, for for some reason? And it was only that later expansion, 50 or 60,000 years ago, that left its genetic impression on on uh, modern day humans. Well, uh, we don't know, but it's an intriguing study. Now, this is, uh, I've already told you this, but, but, but here it is um, diagrammatically. Um, it, it, just turn your hand upside down. Here's the root here, say uh, 2 million years ago, or two, yeah, 2 million years ago with the rectus, and, um, and erectus is brain getting larger and dispersing into Eurasia and within Africa. And, um, but uh, diverging into those three groups I mentioned several minutes ago, one group that ended up diverging into a kind of a ghost, ghost species for which we have no fossils, but we have genetic evidence for another arm that led, that's the middle group there to the Denosicans and Neanderthals. And then on the right side here into various human, modern human groups that ended up in Europe, East Asia, um, and uh, and Africa. Um, uh, so that's kind of the rough map, dispersal map, and origins map. So now I, I'm showing you this because these are two uh, uh, reconstructions of Neanderthals, and um, I, I think they must have been in lockdown because uh, neither one of them got to a barber any more than I have. But um, but um, I don't know about you, but the reconstruction on the right looks, uh, uh, aside from the unruly hair, um, he, he could pass for us on, on the street. I don't know that the fellow on the left would. Um, because you can see the, the heavier uh, superorbital bony margins, um, but 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 they're both those th those are both Neanderthals. That the, the right Neanderthal looks like a modern human to me, anyway. Um, and just this slide is I kind of turned the, the branching on its side here, and. Uh, I'm just making the point that, or, or this slide is making the point that, that there were gene transfer sex between these branches for some time between modern, uh, uh, between modern humans 
in Africa and outside of Africa with Neanderthals, with Denosophans, Denosophans with Neanderthals, and uh, and with these are and with these ghost species. Um, now here's a, a an imagined uh, picture of what the, this ghost species, the uh, Denosophan, the, the, the young Denosophan girl, and you think, well, gee, where did they come up from that? Because the only fossil that we have um, uh, is uh, is a is really a, a part of a jaw. So where does all this come from? Well, it turns out that there are uh, certain genes that that influence the, the shape of the head and, and the jaw, and so working backward from the from the DNA, they constructed what what she might look like. So um, well, I don't know whether you should take that seriously or not, but but it's but it's it's an interesting technology. So we'll see where that goes. Now we come to the, the part that I introduced at the very start of this. What are the distinguishing traits of humans and the and Neanderthals? And I include the two now. I think Neanderthals, uh, you know, for Long, long time were thought as a kind of brutish, uh, heavy bone, heavy bone, heavy muscle uh, dimwits. Well, they're anything but. Uh, they were anything but, and based on on the fact that, that we have found that they created or were left art on cave walls, uh, at least twenty thousand, and in some cases much longer or much earlier than that, before modern humans. And the nature of that art suggests they must have had symbolic language. And if symbolic language, then imagination and storytelling. And perhaps, certainly the case of modern humans, to be this capacity to imagine a virtual other worlds, other existences, mystical figures, mystical virtual relationships with, with uh, animals or hybrid forms of animals with the uh, heads of, of animals and bodies of, of humans and, and just to imagine those type of creatures and, and being able to imagine a future and remembering a past and religion and music and musical instruments. And, and indeed, um, Robin Dunbar, who's an evolutionary biologist at, at Oxford, made this comment um, about, about modern humans. And he said, there are two key aspects of culture that stand out as being uniquely human. One is religion, the other is storytelling. There is no other living species that can do either of these. Both require language of sufficient quality. Oh, that's a wonderful way to put it. Of sufficient quality to allow that. What is important about both is that they require us to live in a virtual world, the virtual world of our imagination. In both cases, we have to be able to imagine that another world exists that is different to and separate from the world we experience on an everyday basis. Absolutely. I think that's I, I think he's spot on there, and and that's what I suggested, um, uh, and perhaps borrowed and paraphrased with, with my opening comment. Well, here's an example of Neanderthal art. I think this particular example goes back uh, uh, sixty thousand years, and uh, in Europe, and and there are kind of animals on the on the on the on the wall and and this is on the right here is really uh, uh, the, the kind of uh, drawn just to, to just make it clear what's actually on the cave here and it's really very symbolic isn't it uh, those dots but here's a rather finely uh, drawn head of, um, of an animal. 
and uh, so and very early, twenty thousand years before modern humans. And here's something. Uh, this is Indonesia. Now a lot of this stuff is flaked off the, the cave wall here, but you can see quite a well rendered animal here from from what's left, and um, and and there are now uh, plentiful examples from the from the Far East dating back to a similar period, maybe even a little earlier, of art that um, that that rivals that in Western Europe. And uh, now here's an example of cave art in Western Europe is beautifully done. Uh, Picasso was moved to suggest at one time that looking at some of this extraordinary cave art in Western Europe, I made the comment that, um, I'm paraphrasing, we have nothing to teach them. Well, I, that's quite an accolade. Um, and, and they certainly are well worked. And, and then it's, it's hard to imagine this art in, in a place that it is, but I'm going to say more about that later. But, but here are these imaginary uh, uh, characters, particularly on the right there, with the head, the antlers, head of an animal and antlers, and, and a humanoid like like body and uh, a lot of Venus um, uh, statues with large breasts, some of them headless, uh, with what was probably a little ring and kind of carried around. Um, and here's Lion Man, head of a lion and body of a, of a human. But here's something that that is really quite extraordinary. This is the oldest flute, and it was made from the thigh bone of a young cave bear. Now there were probably four holes, maybe five holes here. Um, this has been reconstructed and, and, um, and actually played. And, um, and at home, I found it on the internet and, and um, and when it was played by a professional flutist, it was it was lovely music. And I think, gee, boy, doesn't that change things? Art on walls and music. Um, and here it is, sixty thousand years ago. Here's an example of a very finely crafted um, uh, human flute. I think it's probably made from ivory. This case, I'm not sure though. Um, but but a beautifully crafted piece from which quite decent music can be played. There's another one, early human flute, 42,000 years ago. Now my son sent this along to me, but um, because on this whole issue about language, well, could name could Neanderthals hear as we do? In other words, were their ears? Uh, anatomically similar, well, almost identical. These are the three bones in the middle ear uh, from the Anderthals, and they're virtually identical to, to modern humans. So did they hear what we hear? Probably, almost certainly, and in the way that we hear. Now this Picasso. Now this is uh, just is I'm I'm. I, I, lo I love the I love footprints, and they uh, they're really quite moving. This is a footprint left by uh, a modern human in what is now Saudi Arabia, uh, 120,000 years ago, and the footprint was left in the lake bed. And and this is a topographic analysis of the depth of the, of the print, but again, the heel strike and forefoot strike and the high arch that is so typical of modern humans, but you could see that in some earlier form with uh, Lucy's footprints that I showed you earlier. But isn't that quite, quite remarkable? 
And you might not recognize this right off the bat, but these are human footprints on the moon. This is the Apollo 11 mission. And here are these footprints and they are there now. Uh, so, and then, and then just recently here, speak about the human imagination and creativity. I have enormous respect for engineers. Engineers collectively and individually do extraordinary things. And, and here is this in February, the landing of this, uh, this rover, the latest rover on Mars. I mean, so much could have gone wrong, but it was so beautifully done. And, uh, and at least, uh, I think it's 12 minutes. Um, I mean, even at the speed of light, it takes that long for signal. So all of this was happening autonomously beyond human control. Uh, amazing. So I'm just going to finish on one thing because, uh, because I started out and I said, uh, you know, the, I think what Marx says as, uh, as human, uh, I would agree with Dunbar about, uh, about religion and, and, uh, and storytelling. Um, but Richard Leakey, now this is the son of the, of the, of the first generation Leakeys, the famous, the, the, well, they were all, they all became quite well known. And, um, and Leakey's son, Richard, uh, you know, spent, he grew up with his parents uh, and Julian Diggs and became quite uh, famous in his own right, discovered to a corner of uh, boy and, and some other critical specimens. But, um, you know, you look at that cave art at Lascaux and, and you wonder what, what, what's in the mind of, of those people. I mean, all of this remarkable art. When he saw it as a teenager with his parents, he was impatient and uh, completely bored with it. But when he became established in his own right by his mid thirties, somewhere in the thirties, maybe early forties, he went back. And this is what he had to say about um, Lascaux. So if you bear with me here, Richard Leakey's response to seeing Lascaux's cave art. So striking were the images from the caves of Lascaux in France dating from 19,000 to 11,000 years ago that Richard Leakey, an acknowledged expert paleoanthropologist from a family of famous paleoanthropologists went on to say in his 1993 book, Origins Reconsidered, this. Standing in the hall of bulls, surrounded by this wild scene, which exudes so much vitality and power, one is overwhelmed by the sense of another age. During my career, I've been privileged to handle many of the great relics of human prehistory some of which I've had the good fortune to excavate myself. The sensations of connectedness that I've always experienced with them has been profound. They are precious links to the past. Here in Lascaux, the emotional charge I felt challenged all of that. Next to the discovery of the Turkana boy, the visit to Lascaux ranks as one of the great moments in my life. Have to use your imagination here. From the Hall of Bulls are two exits, each extraordinary. The first leads to the Axial Gallery, a narrow passageway richly decorated on all sides. A large red cow with a black head, a stag in full roar, several delightful yellow horses. Finally, a large horse galloping toward the end of the gallery where the calcite encrusted ceiling swoops down and forms a pillar. There winding itself around the pillar, lying on its back, its legs flailing in the air, mouth open as if winning, is a horse. In order to see the image, I had to contort myself in this cramped space, 
Imagine the challenge of painting it in the first place. Imagine the motivation to paint it there and in that position. Imagine the yellow flame of the oil lamp flickers in the cold. Still air of this corner, still air of this corner of the great cave. The young man holding the lamp, trying in vain to throw good light onto the surface of the pillar. Echoing down the narrow gallery, the sound of rhythmically stamping feet, an urgent repetitive song. The atmosphere tensed, everyone now exhausted, taunt with expectation. They know the end is near. For an hour, the undulating intensity of their dancing, their singing, their emotion had swept them on onward. Seen with unwatching eyes as the shaman surged deeper and deeper into a trance, entering a world forbidden to all others, trembling, growing, as if in pain with eyes turned inward to the other world, the shaman clad in horsehide has left their circle, gone down the narrow gallery, drawing power from the images already on the walls by turning to them, touching them, being them, now to serve once more as the medium for the equine potency. Crouched by the pillar with paints provided by the youth, the shaman works at the image with a fervor whose source was another world. The spirit knows what image it needed. The shaman merely the channel. The contorted rock face, not just an allegory of despair, but now the experience of despair. No longer is the end of this gallery an interesting rock formation. It has been transformed into the place of despair. The equine potency knows why. The people have an inkling and talk in whispers about it. But even if she could remember the trance experience, remember being this winning horse facing disaster, cipher for the spheres of the coming year, she wouldn't talk about it. Shaman, don't. And he adds, by fantasy, of course. But in these painted caves in LaSalle, especially, the images and the often inexplicable situation drive the imagination. There is tangible power in these places that speaks of their importance in their lives of ancestors. It's really quite extraordinary. It's very well written. It's all his imagination tr triggered off by, by these images. But, but it does speak to the power of those images to somebody uh, 20 to 30,000 years later and the capacity to move. Now, Richard Leakey spent most of his life in East Africa. He would have been aware of shaman, shamanistic traditions and, and probably knew of, was familiar with some uh, hunter-gatherer groups before they were altered or changed by, by um, modern human society. So, um, so he would have, that probably played into his imagination there. But I thought, I thought you should hear that because clearly that's very different than early Erectus and the Australopithecus. The lights kind of went on in brains sometime. I don't know exactly when, and maybe gradually, but over the last several hundred thousand years, and maybe especially the last hundred thousand uh, or more. So that's what I wanted to say today. Now, next week, we're going to deal with the, some of the tools that we use to, uh, to study the brain um, with some examples. And I'm going to use some clinical examples. By the way, you might want to go on the website because on that web, website are a couple of uh, original papers from the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, illustrative cases that I'm going to talk about, but, um, but also some other material that might be interested in. And um, maybe not all because there's a lot there, but, um, but let's see if you're interested. And I look forward to seeing you next week.
Thank you very, very much.